Good morning, everyone. This is the Diversity Industries Accountability Call, August 8th, 2021. And today we have Dr. Tiffany Wilson all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. And so I just want to welcome all you all that are deciding to join us today on our this morning's call because Dr. Wilson has some wonderful information that's gonna revolutionize the way in which you see dentistry, but then also give you the tips and the tricks that are gonna allow you to be successful to diversify dentistry. So once again, good morning, get your notebook, get your pen pad, get your pen and get ready to take notes because right now and during this interview, we're gonna have a wonderful time learning about her story and how she diversified dentistry, all right? So good morning, Dr. Wilson. Welcome, morning, welcome, Kelly. welcome. Thank you. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, I'm good. How about you? Fantastic. I see you have a beautiful colored shirt on. I think I see some some, yes. those, some font, a font. Okay, I like that. I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I see you got a font that I'm familiar with. I see you have a font that I'm familiar with. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump right in. So um, Dr. Wilson, Tell us about your story. You, you know, you, I see that you have a shirt on, so you, you so you got to Meharry. It, it looks yes. like. All right, so yes. do this. Um, tell the audience who you are, how you got started, so on and so forth. Take us all. T start us from high school. How you wanted to go through and get the undergrad, and then we'll transition all the way through. All right, all right. Good morning, everyone. As Dr. Williams said, my name is Dr. Tiffany Wilson. I am a 2010 graduate of Meharry Medical College. So my story really started even before high school. It, it's funny how your life can come full circle because the doctor who actually brought me into this world was a Meharian. So it, it is amazing mm -hmm. how just matriculating through life, I remember I always wanted to be a healthcare professional. Um, I became interested in dentistry with my two orthodontists who are actually Meharians as well. Wow. And they always spoke about just their excitement, just how Meharry prepared them for, you know, their particular profession in orthodontics. So, you know, I did my homework when I graduated from high school, I went to Oakwood University and they had at that point, it was the Oakwood Biomedical Association, where every Friday we would take a trip to various uh, medical schools, dental schools. And I remember I went with the my biology class to Meharry Medical College. And, you know, we got a tour of the facilities. We got a chance to see student life, speak to some of the students. And it was just this recurring theme of how Meharry was dedicated to service to the underserved. And it really seemed like a good fit for me coming from Oakwood, who also had the mission of enter to learn, depart to serve. So, it, you know, it's some things you just never forget. So I was, I, I just knew that Meharry was for me. I applied for dental school. I was so grateful that um, I actually applied to two dental schools. I applied to Meharry. And I applied to um, one of the schools in my home state, which is Illinois. And so I was thankful that I got into both. But for some reason, at the interview at Meharry, I remember one of my professors, Dr. Hines, and during the interview process, he said, you know, um, of all the schools you go to, I think this would be the best fit because we're like a family. Mm -hmm. And so that just really struck home for me when I you know, was accepted. At that time, our dean was Dean William Butler. It was just a welcoming experience, which was just a continuation of what I had experienced at Oakwood University, which is also an HBCU. So it was just a smooth transition for me. I knew I wanted to be in dentistry. I knew I wanted to be at Meharry so much so, you know, God opened the door for me to come back as faculty. So, you know, it, it's just really been a great experience. You know, um, you're the first person I, I, I've ever known to have so much contact with Meharians. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Somebody brought you in the world and then you shadowed. Yeah. I guess it sounds like you were destined to be a Meharian through and through. Right. Yeah. Through and yeah. through. So um, 
you tell me about tell me about Oakwood. How I mean, what, what was that experience like? Um, I know it's an HBCU. Then you doubled down and did another HBCU. So just walk us through that. What was your experience there? How was your GPA? How was your like for all those that are listening? You know, planning on wanting to just prepare them. So Oakwood um, was a wonderful experience, just like Meharry. It was in the South, it's in Huntsville, Alabama, which was a transition for myself um, living outside of Chicago. So what I will say, again, you know, friends, I mean, friends of family members, everyone had matriculated through Oakwood. Mm. So that was yet another place I knew I wanted to be because it really fit in with, you know, the mission of service that I knew that was for me. And I kind of, I went in, you know, majoring in biology. One thing I will um, tell the listeners is that if you do want to go to dental school, you don't necessarily have to major in the sciences. Mm. Back in those days, I felt as though... That was mandatory, you know, I have to, everybody wants to major in biology, you know, if you're going to pre-med, pre-dental, you know, you major in biology, you major in biochemistry, you know, so that is one uh, misconception that I had, but what I will say, you know, matriculating through biology is that I was able to take so many of the same courses that I took when I was a first year student at Meharry. Mm -hmm. I had taken uh, biochemistry, I had taken, um, parts of gross anatomy, you know, I was well prepared. Um, I had always been used to studying very diligently, but one thing I will say at Oakwood is that I did a lot of studying, a lot of studying. I did have a very high GPA, uh, very competitive, but it, it, de it definitely took a lot of hard work, but it prepared me for the very intense studying that I would be doing, especially as a first year dental student at Meharry. Okay. So... Went to HVC, so got to Meharry. He had two options. He took the the family approach. Um, tell us about that experience, Meharry. So when I came to Meharry, it was very much like what I ex had experienced at Oakwood. It was a you know family atmosphere. You had um, I had another classmate who was from Oakwood. I had other classmates who were from other HBCU. So it just you know, it fit. It was a family atmosphere. The faculty, the staff were always available if you needed to, you know, talk about anything. If you had any questions, they were there for you. So it wasn't like you were an island. One thing I will say is that dentistry and dental school is one profession that you can't do by yourself. You need people, mentors, mm -hmm. you need friends, you need, you know, th this is not something that you it's advantageous to get through a loan. So you'll need, you know, the help of your family, your friends, you know, that moral support, that mental support. You need the help of faculty, of classmates. So Meharry really was just a perfect fit in that respect because dental school, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but it, it can be very stressful. I mean, the hours that you put in, not just studying with, like, didactic, type of work but also clinical work I can remember being in the lab till probably two or three in the morning in those days so it really takes a lot out of you mentally so you need that supportive atmosphere that you know Meharry actually affords to you know its enrollees and attendees so you had a double down of HBCU is that like the best route to take as an applicant uh, who's African, who's black, um, Hispanic, you know, Native American, Pacific, like, is that a, is that a, is that a, is that the best route to take from your perspective? Um, I think it depends on everyone. For me, it was the best route coming from an HBCU in Huntsville. Okay. You're just going two hours north of Nashville. It was not, um, a culture shock. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friend who's from the East coast. And when she came to Meharry, she was, uh, just shocked. She had never been to Nashville. She had never been to the South. You know, she was used to a very heavily populated urban area, wow. you know, that was outside of New York City. So it was very different for her. So in that respect, yes, I do believe that it would be um, advantageous either to be at an HBCU. If you have not gone to an HBCU, at least familiarize yourself with, you know, the mission of the school, familiarize yourself with the vision of the school, speak to residents, reach out to them. I know 
Student Doctor, Doctor Network is a great um, avenue to go just to be able to speak to um, students, to residents about their experience. So I will say on an individual basis for me, that was the best thing. Okay. That definitely was the best thing. You know, it's interesting, you know, um, I, I'm also from, I'm from Houston. I also went to Oakwood. I also went to Meharry. And it's interesting, um, outside of just space, it didn't, I guess I didn't, it, there really wasn't too much of a difference. I know be, being, being from Texas, but Nashville is a little different than Oakland's a little, than Huntsville is a little different. So it's just interesting. So I, I really appreciate the perspectives. Um, so you went through Oakwood, um, you're delivered by a Meharian, you, yeah. <laughs> you shadow um, Meharians. Then you matriculate through Oakwood, you matriculate through Meharry. Um, what was the experience after that? Like, what, what what happened next? I know you got a couple of degrees behind your belt. It's not just the DES. You got, you're doing yeah. some big things. So give us give us some insight on that. Give us some insight on that. You, 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 I know you did a residency. Tell us about that. Yes. Give us some insight yes. on that. So after I graduated from Meharry, I completed a general practice residency, which is a one to two year residency in hospital dentistry. So I was at Indiana University in Indianapolis, which was, we'll say, three hours south of home for me. Um, that is a predominantly white institution. Um, my program definitely was diverse. It was myself and um, two other minorities out of six. So it, it was a great experience, although it was not an HBCU, it also was a family experience. I was very grateful mm -hmm. for um, just the continuation of um, hospital dentistry and the skills that I learned while there. Um, after that, I practiced um, in private practice with an owner doctor that was outside of Sacramento, California. That was very different um, because it was more of a, and, and I, I'm trying to think of a particular place I can compare it to. I, I know of one particular place I can, but I don't know if everybody knows. So we'll just say it was kind of a, a very rural area. Um, after that, I moved to Southern California. I was in corporate dentistry. I worked also in private practice. So we'll say I was in corporate dentistry a couple days a week. I was in private practice um, another couple of days of the week. After I completed my time with corporate dentistry, I just did full private practice and academia at Loma Linda University. So well, before, before, we, before we get to, we're gonna jump to that in a second, but just pulling you back, you know, talking about this residency, why was a, a residency important to you? Or was For it important me, to you? You just like, hey, I don't know what to do. Let me jump in red and see. Let me jump. It, 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 it was important for me mm -hmm. because I had, of course, been through dental school, yes, but, you know, within our dental school experience, you see a patient, one patient in the morning, you see one in the afternoon, that's your whole mm -hmm. day. Yeah. Same thing, Monday through Friday. So when you get out into, you know, we'll say the real world and start practicing, mm -hmm. I mean, you can see up to, in corporate dentistry, I might have seen about 45 patients a day. So I needed that additional year really to hone on my dental skills. I wanted to, you know, perfect those skills and I needed to bring my speed up. You know, you go from working to two patients to an expectation of 45. It, it's good to have some time where you can, you know, get in and you can really get your speed up and efficiency of. So that was definitely a desire for me. Um, Meharry has a general practice residency department as well. So we would have seminars with faculty and residents who would talk about the program and who really talked about how it was beneficial for them. So even, you know, my fourth year, I knew I wanted to apply and, you know, I'm very grateful that I was able to get in and very beneficial. So, hold on, hold on. Why, okay, maybe you said it, maybe my mind went off somewhere, but why residency? But that's a, that's, a, a, that's a very high level thought because a lot of students want to just get out and make that bread, make the bag, get, get the coins, and so on. So how did you, what was going on? How did you make that, make that, um, 
make the decision. So for me, I just <clears throat> really just needed that extra year okay. just okay. to, it was definitely, like I said, speed, exposure in my residency. Okay. We worked in the operating room. We worked in the emergency room, in the burn unit. We mm-hmm. worked in the cancer center. So really working with those immunocompromised mm-hmm. patients, I think, was great for when I actually got out and practiced. Okay. Wow. I, he, didn't, he didn't tell me that pre-interview. He didn't yeah. tell me that. <laughs> he didn't tell me that pre-interview. I would have been prepared. I'd ask him more questions. Now he got me looking like a little crazy on here. He got me a little crazy. <laughs> All right, I like it. I like it. I like it. So you just felt so. Was it because of Meharry that didn't prepare you, or was it just hey, I just want to no, have Meharry a little bit more? Prepared me. Okay. Meharry prepared me, but I wanted to have that additional experience okay. where I, like I said, you build your speed up and you see a variety of patients. So yes, I was definitely prepared, okay. but you just, I just wanted that additional experience. Okay, and then transitioning back into the um, university. Um, what was it? University of Chicago, right? No, Indiana. No, Indiana. Uh, Indiana. Yeah, Indiana. Indiana. Okay, yeah. So, um, how was that experience? Uh, that residency. It was process? wonderful. Okay. It was wonderful. We had. Uh, I was one of six residents. Yeah, you said that. Again, okay. that same family-like atmosphere. Um, Indianapolis, especially where the hospital and the school is located, was it was outside of an urban area, so you still had. Um, underserved type of populations but additionally it was in like a smaller city type atmosphere very welcoming a lot of family events so that was a good fit for me cool, cool, cool. so you did the you did the gpr hospital base mm-hmm. taking care of patients who are in the er cancer mm-hmm. unit all these different especially places that you won't get in dental school yeah. just that exposure yeah. Um, what was in, you said you um, went into private practice to give us some insight yes. on that. Give us some insight on that. So uh, my first experience in private practice was outside of Sacramento okay. in a very rural area. So we'll say I would see maybe about eight patients per day. Mm-hmm. Very slow. You know, I would do bread and butter, you know, operative. We're doing restorations and a few root canals. I saw a couple of children. Mm-hmm. Uh, But it was very slow at the beginning. Um, That brought about my transition to corporate dentistry, which was on the other side, you know, um, it it was completely different, extremely fast. You know, here you're seeing patients, I mean, every five, ten minutes. So, Mm. you know, it was a switch, I think, for me. And it was also in a different part of California. And, you know, the infamous Southern California that is heavily populated, you know, so mm-hmm. it, it was a bit of a transition, those particular um, areas of California. So what was the difference between outside of high, high pace? What was the difference in like corporate or private pay wise? You know, wh- which one did you feel that was most suitable for you um, at that time? So actually, we'll say if I could have had a transition from maybe a more busier private practice because corporate dentistry of course for me uh, was much it was fast but it, it paid a lot now I, you didn't have to want for anything but it it was very very busy you know working six days out of the week uh, it, six it days just, oh yes yes when you first get in you know when you first start working you get in there for, we'll say, the first two months, and then, you know, they start you off for five days, then after that, I got into six days, and then it, I mean, on that seventh day, all I was doing was resting, I mean, recuperating for work for the mm-hmm. next day, so, you know, it, it, you were on roller skates, yeah, you definitely were on roller skates. How long did that last for? For me, that was about six months. Okay. Um, because one thing I like to do is really have a relationship with my patients. Um, I do like to meet a diverse uh, population, but I like to form a relationship with them. And that was just a little too quick for me to really get to know them, uh, to, you know, do more than just kind of formulate a treatment plan, but to get, you know, to know them, to get to know their history outside of just medical history. So 
uh, that's when, you know, I fast forwarded and did academia when I was in Southern California. Gotcha. So you wouldn't, you, so you just didn't leave private practice because it was too much. You had, it sounds like you had another plan going. Sounds like yeah. you, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, I just want to, for the audience to just kind of get aware. She was just like, I ain't yeah. getting out, I'm getting out of here. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So corporate, corporate six months. Um, and so, yeah, cause I think this is super important. So it sounded, uh, when we were talking before we are preparing for the interview, you were talking about how this practice kind of helped blossom your next step. So you were talking about the, there was two offices that you're going through from on the corporate side and it helped develop the next step in Dr. Wilson's journey. So give us some yes. insight on that. Give us yes. some insight on that. So uh, when I was working in corporate dentistry in Southern California, I saw a lot of Dentical or Medicaid patients. Uh -huh. I began to notice um, just a similarity between <clears throat> a lot of them where you would have gross decay, you'd see children coming in, they would have, I mean, just significant caries. And the question for me kind of shifted from, let me restore these, you know, cavities to why does this occur? And are certain populations at a higher risk than others? So I think that's kind of what created the interest for public health for me. Um, I was able to see just a variety of, you know, populations and it just, it, it just brought excitement. It kind of made me question why, which then, you know, grew to kind of the next phase in my life, the public health phase. Really, so I, I really appreciate um, you highlighting that why, because, you know, a lot of people will go their whole career and not yes. get to that point. How did, please, please, please give me, break that down, because that, that's a paradigm shift for, for individuals. How did you get to that why? Like, what happened mm -hmm. during that time frame? Give me some insight, please. Um, I kind of got to a point where I wanted to know, you know, my purpose. Hmm. Just beyond dentistry, you know, how did God want to use me on this earth really to help others? And so what I did was, you know, I began to do my homework. I took my you know, newfound passion for public health and then began to look at institutions that may, you know, offer um, information in public health, a master's in public health, particularly um, what I was looking for was more of uh, health promotion, disease prevention, which is actually what my concentration was in my program. Um, there are a lot of particular concentrations you can take. You can take health policy, health management. It's just a variety. But especially being um, a dentist, I wanted to focus more on um, disease practices, you know, health education, health promotion, which was what I eventually did. You know, um, we're going to get into that. And, you know, you really taught me something. I just I love these calls because it's like I get to learn so much while, while I'm giving at the same time. And so when you said the health promotion, um, I was like, wow, what's the difference in health education and health promotion? But we'll jump into that. I was like, whoa, that's really interesting. Um, so tell us this. So you figure out what your purpose is. And, you know, I really want to just pause right here because there's a lot of people that just go through the motion and they're just mm -hmm. doing their work. And sometimes right. it's easy to disregard what you're actually there. And, you know, um, there's this principle I go by, you know, never despise the low areas of where you are. Um, right. because those, those low places or those places that you technically don't want to be in a situation, don't want to be end up propelling you to a place yes. that, you know, is for your purpose. And so if you despise those places, you'll be, you'll never able to see the window or the chimney shoot. You're going to get out of to see exactly and get the exposure that you are. So I'm really glad that you brought that up because a lot of people just say, oh, I didn't like it. I just want to, no, 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 no. I'm so glad you brought that up. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that piece out. So you jump into your MPH. Where was that? How long was it? What's going on in your mind? How did you get to that point? So on and so. Oh, you, we got to the point from the corporate office. Now tell us how, Correct. why MPH? What was going on? And go from there. So MPH, I just wanted to learn about disease processes in populations versus just individuals. So I did my homework. I began to research institutions that would cater to really my desire. 
um, I looked at institutions across the country and I came across um, a master's in public health program that was actually within Chicago, um, about maybe 35 minutes from my home that offered a concentration in health promotion and disease prevention. So I relocated from California back to uh, my home in Illinois, and I became a full-time MPH student. My program was 48 hours, which was two years. I took um, four courses per semester. I also had a summer experience that I can talk about later. And so I completed the program in exactly, you know, 24 months. Okay. I'm ignorant. Give me the inside of a public health. What does that do? What, 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 where does, yeah, help me. So, especially, we'll say dental public health okay. is a, an ADA recognized specialty within the field of dentistry. Public health in particular deals with disease processes in populations. Gotcha. It looks at health disparities. Um, it looks at uh, food deserts. In other words, it, we also look at uh, socioeconomic status. So why do some populations based on their education, why are they more at risk than other populations? We also look at how your zip code affects your dental health. So just a lot of different areas you learn when you know you matriculate through an MPH program. Okay. So um, I know some, uh, if you're like me, you're like, what's the difference in education and health promotion? Give us some insight on that. Why was that important? Give us a difference. Yes. So especially being a dentist, you um, have a calling to educate your patients. So, you know, you tell them exactly what's going on. You create a treatment plan. Uh, you know, you kind of go from there. Health promotion is more of that modeling type of um, component where we get into, okay, you know, this is what happens if this, let's say, uh, if you have periodontitis, you're more at risk for, you know, cardiovascular disease. Okay, I've educated you, but I can go a step further and I can promote ways in which you can decrease your level of periodontitis risk. Um, you know, I can go over um, health behavior type of models with you. We can go over how to lower your risk. So in other words, I am someone who is assisting you. Instead of just providing the information, I am providing and modeling the information for you. So I'm kind of going that extra step with health promotion. Do you, is, Are there like ADA fees or codes that you could add on to take advantage of those, that counseling? To my knowledge, and see, <laughs> to my knowledge, there is, okay. yes. Um, you know, there is a, you know, health prom or health education code. I know sometimes when uh, a person may go out and do particular events, yes, there is, I believe, a health, uh, a health education code, yes, that can be added. Okay. Because I'm all about serving the people, but I also know that things got to <laughs> we got where the money reside. We got we got we got to get to that part. You know, I, I'm the type of person I'm gonna say something that people are just thinking, so I I, I got to put it out there. I got to put it out there. Okay. All right. So you talked about a food desert. For those that don't know what the heck a food desert is, can you give us some insight on that? So a food desert is an area, let's say, in which you do not have access to let's say a grocery store mm. or a grocery store with fresh vegetables, fruits. So you may have a grocery store that just has canned vegetables or, you know, canned goods, a lot of things that have preservatives in them. A food desert may not even have a grocery store in it. So now at that point you have individuals who are driving 45 minutes away just to get to a grocery store in those type of neighborhoods they may be filled with fast food restaurants. Those restaurants typically tend to lead over time to a patient being unhealthy, possibly obesity. So those are food deserts that don't have adequate resources to maintain the health of the population. Is a food desert a really bad thing if you have like the convenience store next door and you just have fast food? Because I know some people 
and have come back that come have been through that 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 pathway of life is that really a big deal is food nutrition that big of a deal food nutrition is that big of a deal because we're looking at high obesity rates mm. now we're looking at a decrease in life expectancy so um health is wealth mm. having knowledge of proper nutrition is something that can add years to your life so um yes there are some neighborhoods that have convenience stores yes uh, but I believe that one of the best things when it comes to, let's say you're shopping around for uh, a new residence, you definitely want to make sure that at the very least you have access to a good, um, grocery store that has healthy fruits, vegetables. It's not really about packaged foods. You're not really looking for a lot of canned goods. It's all about, uh, nuts grains you know fresh fruits and vegetables and those type of things so it sounds like a daniel diet is that, is that what you're saying <laughs> right. yes. Yes. But back to eating back to eating all right back to eating all right all right all right all right, all right. so um your you finished your mph now how did you know what was the next stop and how did you know to get there so the next step after finishing the MPH, I was kind of at a crossroads again. Um, I just had, you know, a one-on-one -on -one with God. I'm a very spiritual person. Some people may, you know, have a good mentor that they speak with. But I think that everyone comes to a time, if you haven't gotten to that point yet, you'll get there. You know, you, you know what you're here to do. You have an occupation that you love. But you wonder, where should you take your talent? You know, where will you be best used? Um, I had had a desire to return to Nashville. I had had a one-on-one -on -one with God. God was leading me back to Nashville. And it was very interesting because um, I had had a conversation with my mom about it. I had not told her about, you know, my one-on-one -on -one heart to heart with God. And, you know, she said, why don't you look back and, you know, look into going back to Nashville? And I really felt that that was kind of, okay, my green light, let me, you know, go back. I had always loved Nashville. I love the city. You know, having lived in California, that it was a plane ride. It's good to be, you know, a few hours away where in case you do need to get home, you can drive. So it, it just seemed like a good fit for me, like that next step for me. I see. Okay. So you had a little talk with Jesus or God. You told him all about your problems. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, he uses your mom to say, hey, you may want to go to Nashville. Um, what, was this, was this, was this a, um, a feeling in your belly? Did you have a, um, did you have a nice burger before you went to bed before you had this? Or this was like, the, <laughs> was this the, was this the right way? Was this the right path going on from there? I, I did not. It's just one of those times when you're like, okay, Lord, what next? Mm -hmm. You know, and you, you begin to hear from him. You begin to hear from people close to you that also communicate with him and you have the same answer. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, you know, when I knew that that was the place for me to return. Now, did you speak to your mom about this and you forgot? And then Jesus all of a sudden gave no, you this insight. No, no. I, I remember. I just want to make sure because there's somebody out there having this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I did not say a word to anyone. I did not. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it was very interesting. You know, it was just all green lights back to Nashville kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so... What happened in Nashville? What are you doing in Nashville? Tell us about that. So, in, after I finished my program, I came back to Nashville as assistant professor in dental public health. Um, in our department, we mentor students. Um, we teach various courses, cultural competency. Um, we teach community dental health, just a lot of public health courses that fall under the umbrella of the specialty of dental public health. We have done um, a lot of community activities and additionally being um, also working clinically, I have assisted the school with our mobile unit where we have a mobile unit van hmm. that will leave Meharry, the urban area, and travel out 
two, two and a half hours to various sites that are in rural areas of uh, Tennessee. Wow. How, so how is that experience? I didn't know two hours, really. Where y'all headed? Where are yeah, there, I know Waynesboro, Tennessee. I've assisted. That was about two hours away. I've been in Waverly, Tennessee. That's, we'll say, about an hour and a half um, headed toward Memphis. We actually had a site in Memphis that was two days. Um, so it it definitely was an experience. I think it was dental public health at its best because you're able to go to communities that may be food deserts or the nearest dentist could be maybe an hour away. Some areas did not even have phone reception. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's a lot of, um, a lot of things that, I, I guess it opens your eyes to being able to practice dentistry in an underserved area, which actually fits into the mission of Meharry. All right. So, so yeah. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm listening to your story and I really like doing um, medical missions to where we go there, treat the people. Um, one thing I do not like is the fact that the medical mission model for those that I've worked with, it's kind of like, I'll use this term, this for this idea. It's like Santa Claus comes once a year, drops all the right. presents, and then for the other 365, 364 days, it's just like <laughs> back, <laughs> back to yeah. back to life as usual. What type of impact is, or is there thought of leaving their your walls marked so that there is an improvement? Like I guess my thought is it's like you know you can give a person you give a person a fish and they eat for a day, or you could show them how to fit you give them a, sure. show them how to fish. Or you give them, so, you know, so I guess my thought is, this is like, what is the, what goes on to, or is that the focus to like really give individuals this insight and move forward? Because that, that was always something um, that I was really concerned with myself when I would, like I said, either do a health initiative or something. It's just like, you know, I, how, yeah. So if we could, if you could so, touch on that. From you all's perspective, from you, from you all's sure. perspective, yeah. So one thing you do bring up is, um, as you say, the Santa Claus is coming to town kind of thing. It seems like it's uh, maybe uh, once in a blue moon type of activity. One thing I will say is that that was a built-in rotation for the students. Mm -hmm. So we were at these sites once or twice a month. Um, we saw these individuals were able to follow up with care with them. Some of them were in a juvenile detention center. So we were really able to reach children, adolescents, young adults who may not, uh, you know, have access to society, period, having a dentist coming in to see them. We would come monthly or twice a month to actually um, – improve their oral health to form relationships with them, you know, and when you come back that following month, you have educated them, you know, you see the change that, you know, you were hoping for. And as I said, my biggest thing is that you um, were able to really hone in on both health education and health promotion with them just by the um, consistent coming that we do so it's one thing I, I like about Meharry is that it's not just uh, you know we come that's it see you next year you know we continue with our patients continue working with them and developing relationships with them you know and really see improvement over time so are y'all do I know this may sound ignorant but are y'all doing dentistry you're all giving um, yes. talk okay so okay. We're, okay. we're doing dentistry we do um, a lot of restorative work. We're doing a lot of fillings. We do extractions. We do profies. Um, you know, a lot of kind of basic type work because there's so much that you can do, you know, on a actual <laughs> mobile unit. But, you know, we kind of do the, the bread and butter of dentistry, you know, with, with the children. So another question. So what was the difference of working corporate in the urban area that you're working in and that California, Loma Linda area versus going out to Waverly, Tennessee. Are you still practicing public health without being a public health dentist? So you're still practicing public health, but it's not, you're still forming 
relationships with patients where you have enough time to sit down and talk to them instead of, I know one instance, um, I had a patient when I was in corporate dentistry and they had an oral surgeon, um, you know, come by and I looked at that particular oral surgeon schedule and I think I saw probably about four patients every half hour. And so the patient would say to me, well, you know, it just reminded me of, I'll say a scene out of a scary movie where, you know, they're coming to anesthetize me, then they go to the next person, then they go to the one after that. So uh, one thing with our mobile unit, we do see um, underserved patients, but you're able to form a relationship with them. And it's not this, okay, I'm coming to you. I have a job to do. Okay. I'm coming to the next person. I have another job to do. You're able to say, you know, how are you introduce yourself, you know, kind of tell your story. Like I'm telling my story. Now you have time to speak to them. It may not be, you know, like when I was in my first private practice office, where it's like eight people a day, we do have, you know, a larger community to see, but you can still have an impact. So it was, it was very different from that corporate dental experience for me. So how are you, are you spending time with the leaders of those communities? Or are you just saying, okay, I'm working with one person at a time and I'm giving them insight on how they could improve? How is it? Yeah. Cause then I have a follow-up question behind that. Right. So yes, we do speak with the, the leaders of the community, typically with juvenile detention centers, you know, we have caseworkers that we're speaking with. We have, mm. you know, a lot of people in the facility that know us, that know we're coming, you know, people that we communicate with prior to our arrival. So, yes, it's, it kind of is a lot of, you know, people that we speak with before we come and do our work. Yeah. Okay. So... How's the pay for a public health dentist? I'm not to get in your business, but I, I know we could Google this, but how, I mean, from going to corporate and then doing public health, like how, how is that, how is that for those that are? So being a public health dentist, it's different from the other specialties. So you are still a general dentist. So yes, you still get general dentist pay, but um, you get a chance to reach populations, which I think is something that's very important. You get to the root of the disease, but you know, for the audience, you, you are a general dentist. So, <laughs> so it's not like, you know, you get now and they like you're a pedo or you're an orthodontist, you know, you're still a general dentist. Yes. Okay. So for somebody out there that's listening to your story, um, why, like, is there a need for public health dentists? Like give us some insight from the, from the practitioner side for those that are, you know, hmm, it, it's a great need for public health dentists. It's so funny. Um, I feel that out of the, I believe we have 10 dental specialties now. I think that dental public health is one of the most that needs um, people to become more educated on that particular profession. I know if I just think of, my classmates, there was no one who looked into public health dentistry. It was a surge of pedo. It was some ortho, a handful of endo, someone with oral surgery. Um, I think now as we matriculate, I do hear some students talking about dental anesthesia, but not really a lot of people talk about dental public health or being a public health dentist. So yes, there is a great need to um, go out into those rural areas to come up with projects as I, I have an actual project for my third year dental students in one of my courses and we come up with an oral health program plan where I ask the students to think of a population, let's say it can be within North Nashville, typically it's within North Nashville, but think of a population that you would like to treat. How do you go about getting the word out about your particular project? Do you speak to dental societies? Do you speak with dentists in the area? You know, how do you really get that information out? You know, from there, what ages do we treat? You know, where exactly are we going to work? You know, where is this particular project going to come out of? And I feel like the students really get um, 
and excitement from it. They, they get a chance to really see how dental public health or being a public health dentist really fits into the realm of dentistry as a whole, we can say. I like it. I like it. I like it. Yeah, you're really, you're really molding these students to um, see a different side. Let me ask you this. Um, what is it like being assistant professor and being able to... Oh, you got a big smile, so it's not like you go... I love it. I mean, I, I smile with things I love. Right. <laughs> so give, give us some insight on that because, you know, you know, you have your hat that you're wearing for a public health dentist being in the community, then you have the hat to where you're dealing with students, you know, now being an assistant professor, then you're going to be the associate professor. Give us some insight about that, 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 <laughs> yeah. give us some insight yeah. on that track. Give us some insight yeah. on that track. Um, one thing I will say is that in addition to this platform, I like yourself, love to mentor students. I think academia for me, being an assistant professor, has, you know, allowed that. Not only can I mentor the students, but I can educate them. You know, we all have had a journey of being educated. It, it, it's so funny, you know, my mother is an educator. She was my first teacher, you know. And I think that it's important that you give back to the community and you educate those who come behind you. So being an assistant professor, especially at my alma mater, I think just makes the experience that much sweeter because I remember what it's like, you know, being a student, you remember what it's like being a student, but you can come back and educate those behind you. I, I always tell colleagues of mine, friends of mine, it's kind of like that show, A Different World, you know, where they came through as students, then you get to the last season, you know, everybody's really the leader. They were once a student, now they're leading that next generation. So, I mean, for me, it's been wonderful. I work in a department with um, a chairperson who was my mentor as a student, who really has been able to show me what it's like to uh, be assistant professor, associate professor, then matriculate to full professor and chair, mm -hmm. to be able to um, teach me of pitfalls to avoid. So one thing I will say, education shows you that those you mentor, okay, you need mentors yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, a continuous circle. So, you know, just being assistant professor has allowed me to really fulfill my purpose and my mission and just everything you know that I had prayed for that has been able to uh, be fulfilled in this one position so it sounds like that, that little that little talk with Jesus and it really really brought everything yeah. full circle this wasn't like a little uh, a dream that came through and then everything yeah I, I like it I like it okay I see where I see where I see I see the path now see the see yeah. your journey I see your journey I see your journey Okay, how did you find this um, this mentor um, while you were in um, became a uh, professor? Like, how did you find that? Because I mean, it's, it's kind of easy to find somebody, you know, in, in high school, then college, then dental school. Then how did you find a you know, mentor at this level? Um, it's just asking around. I I like to be vocal with things that I need. You know, coming in as assistant professor, you know, a person may start off as instructor, you become assistant professor. From there, that's classified as junior faculty. So typically the way my hair is set up is that the senior faculty, the associate professors, the professors typically mentor the junior faculty. Mm -hmm. And so even without me knowing, you know, my chairperson was mentoring me. So within Meharry, I did not really, you know, have to ask, we mentor me, you know, I need some help. People can see this is someone who's new and, you know, going back to this family atmosphere, you know, mm. what do you need? Do you need assistance in this? Especially going from working clinically to working in academia, okay, you do need to have some idea of how to educate your students, how to hold their attention, you know, how do you present the material? So just having mentors for that, you know, readily available without even asking. Mm -hmm. um, I do have mentors that are back in my home. Uh, the orthodontist that I spoke of, they are my mentors that, you know, I call whenever I have maybe questions. Um, so, yes, it's just asking and even just being blessed with those who will be your mentor without you even, you know, asking them. 
I like it. I like it. I like it. So you're this. So let's say this. Um, in the next five years, what do you see yourself in your career? And I'll give it out. And then, you know, um, yeah, in your career. Yeah. Where, where do you see yourself in the next five years in your career? So if somebody were to watch this, so if somebody, I'm sorry, so if somebody were to watch this, event, she did do it. Dr. Wilson did do it, follow through. What, what does she see in her career? I, I see myself as still making an impact at Meharry, still reaching those students who are coming through, you know, wondering what is dentistry like, you know, what path do I need to take, mentoring them. Um, you know, we each start out be it as a dental student, be it in college, in high school, we kind of, we all have a beginning point, mm. you know, and we continue to grow over the years. So I really see myself in the position, you know, where I am to continue to matriculate, to educate, to mentor the students at Meharry. It, it has been, you know, a blessing. I've been here, you know, thus far for three years, mm -hmm. and the students that were first-year dental students when I came are now fourth year. You know, they're now seniors. So just to see them grow, just to see their excitement about dentistry, to be able to talk to them about applying to residencies, you know, what's the best fit for them, mentoring them, you know, has really been a blessing. So I see myself just continuing in that same path. Okay. So I have a couple more questions, and then we're going to let you go. Um, if you were in charge, where would you, where would you want to put your imprint? What would that look like if you were in charge and you were leading out at Meharry and, you know, give us some insight from that perspective. Well, I feel like that's a loaded question. Mm -hmm. I would still it is. see myself, <laughs> I would still see myself, um, you know, in, in dental public health, mm -hmm. still taking a leadership position. Um, last year in 2020, I was selected as a Dean Scholar. Mm. So that meant that I received mentorship, I receive educational courses, and can also take, let's say, an additional program, you know, to hone in on my skills. So I see myself continuing um, working nationally right now. In addition to working at Meharry, I am the president-elect of the Community and Preventive Public Health Dentistry Section of ADEA. Mm -hmm. So I see myself uh, well, really ADEA working. is what? Before you go any further? ADEA is the, uh, what is it, Advanced Education, no, Advanced Dental Education Association. Mm -hmm. or, uh, no, excuse me, American Dental Education Association. There we go. That's what. Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I see myself educating those not just in Tennessee not just in, at Meharry but also really taking my voice nationally as well mm. all right all right so all right so for all those students out there for the um, women who are wanting to take a path into where you're wanting to where you are currently or the men that are out there that are just like you know what public health dentistry is something I want to look into what advice or what counsel would you give them um, as we um, bring this to a close? What, what, if, what information would you want to give them? I would say to do your homework to mm. see if this is for you, just like more than likely you've done your homework to see if dentistry is for you. Find a mentor, find someone who has taken that route, someone who is a public health dentist or who is in the area of dental public health. Ask them about their experiences. Do they like it? What is a typical day like for them, be it in academia, be it possibly working at the CDC? You know, what, what is a day like for them? Um, just ask them deep questions like, you know, what you've asked me. Just kind of ask them what is it about public health dentistry or dental public health that you like? And just speak to several people about that. Find out if that's the path for you and definitely get a village behind you. As I started out saying, you know, dentistry is not um, an island occupation. You know, we need one another. Well, you know, you need a village behind you. You need family to support you. You need 
need friends, you need mentors, you know, you need your community behind you because you will be working in the community. So you need to get out, you need to speak with people. You know, if this is something you're interested in, look at the community you want to work in. What are some of the areas that really need, um, what are some of the areas that there are deficiencies? Are there food deserts in, you know, your particular community? If so, what are the stakeholders? Who do you speak to about, you know, changing that? So it, it's just a lot of questions, I think, especially when it comes to deciding what you're interested in, what area you're interested in, but just find people who can really mentor you and, you know, kind of give it to you as it is, give it to you straight, you know, what is it like? Find some honest people. That is what I will say. Find honest mentors who are really, um, working to mentor you. I think one thing you and I had talked about is when it comes to mentorship, you know, you got to give your all. You can say, I want to be mentored, but you know, you have to stick with it. So you have to find mentors who will hold you accountable and then you hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, you stick with them, but they stick with you. So I think that's important. What a way to end the call off. I like it. Throw <laughs> the accountability in at the end. I love it. I love it. I love it. So Dr. Wilson, before we get out of here, um, if there was somebody that's watching this um, live or, you know, watching as a rebroadcast, how would they be able to get in contact with you? I don't want you to give out your personal phone number. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I want that. I want you to do anything like that. But if they would be able to get, <laughs> I got you covered, sis. I got you covered, sis. So how would they be able to reach out to you either via email or, you know, being able to contact you at your office at Meharry? Um, how would, sure. if you could leave that with sure. us, we could, we could, um, okay. Really so if anyone needs to contact me or social media as well, or social media as well, if that's something. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm typically not really okay. on social media. So I think the best route would be, um, to email me. My email address is T E Wilson. So T E W I L S O N at M M C dot E D U. And then I can't give my work number. My work number is 615-327-6210. And I always get back with messages. You know, you can always send me an email, you know, introduce yourself. Just say, you know, I heard your story. I have a similar story. Or I'm just interested in learning more about dental public health. And I'll make sure that I do return your email and your call. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, Dr. Wilson, it was an honor and a privilege yes. to have this one-on-one -on -one again. Um, you were uh, a year ahead of me, um, so it's all yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it, it was it's it was always great, you know, seeing old friends. So yeah, it, it, thank you so much for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, once again, this concludes our accountability call for August eighth. So once again, the reason why we have this call is to give you insight, to hold you accountable so that you can diversify dentistry. Because we want you to remember at Diversity in Dentistry, if we did it, so can you. So have a fantastic day. There's greatness inside of you. And we look forward to seeing you grow, develop, and make dentistry better. Make it a great one.